Liberty sees me, it stands by me, and celebrates me for who I am. When I come into the office, I feel that I belong here. I don't have to be corporate America Gabby. I can just bring Gabby to work. Reach your potential and find a job you love at Liberty Mutual. We offer development training, rich benefits, and a culture that lets you bring your whole self to work so you can pursue your tomorrow today. Ready to consider a career at Liberty Mutual? Find out how at LibertyMutualCareers.com. This is Donald Parham. You're listening to Chargers Unleashed, part of the L.A. Football Network. Stay jiggy. And hey, this is Chris from the second Chargers outside linebacker. And make sure you check out Chargers Unleashed. Shout out to Chargers Unleashed. Sebastian Joseph, they know the vibes. We outside. Are you checking in with Mike Williams from the L.A. Chargers? And you're tuning in to Chargers Unleashed. You're listening to the Chargers Unleashed podcast with your host, Dan Wolkenstein and Jake Hefner. Welcome to another edition of Chargers Unleashed. Jake Hefner and Dan Wolkenstein here with you from the LA Football Network. Today's show, of course, being brought to you by Bet Online, Charger Bolt Family, and Rock Solid Sports Memorabilia. If this is your first time tuning into the show, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Dan Wolkenstein. Uh, finally. One of the, finally, one of the reasons that I love this time of year is, you know, we're deep into the draft talk. We're a month away from the NFL draft. But we have guests on the show like we have today. This just truly makes you feel like you're in the trenches, like you're immersed in it right now. And if you caught my YouTube short yesterday, me just trying to pass the time, waiting on who the special guest was going to be for this episode, uh, I was losing it yesterday. If you saw me on the YouTube shorts, it was <laughs> it was sad. It really was. But I am so happy because the wait is finally over. One of my favorite guests on this show, not just to talk NFL draft, but very special to this podcast in general when it comes to kicking off the Chargers Unleashed banner, if you will. The very first guest that we ever had on this show for episode one of Chargers Unleashed, the one and only from PFF and the NFL Stock Exchange, Trevor Sykema. So stoked for what he's going to be bringing to the table and sharing with us as it relates to all things Chargers draft talk today. Before we get to Trevor Sykema, which honestly... One of my favorite discussions we always have every year is with him. I think this is now second or third year in a row we've talked to Trevor Sikama. And again, sure. he called his shot two years ago, which we'll get into the predictions. You'll see what he predicts for the Chargers this year. But two years ago, he predicted the Chargers get Rashawn Slater. So Tom Telesco, Brandon Staley, Chargers fans, you're welcome. I guess I should say you're welcome. Trevor Sikama should say you're welcome. Um, so, Jake, on that note, over or under 0.5? Number of predictions a one Trevor Sikama gets correct about the Chargers in this year's draft. See, Dan, well, you, it, it, no, 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 hang on, because it, it's it's more than just asking someone like, hey, who are the Chargers going to pick at twenty one? You really like to pick Trevor's brain, and this has been proven the last couple of years where it's like, I don't want just what you're going to pick at twenty one. I want like twenty one and beyond. Yeah. So I don't know what you're putting the line at. But whatever you put it 0.5. I put 0.5. (laughs) (laughs) You're going to do that because I know you. So that's easy. That's very easy to know. But anyways, before we get into the interview with Trevor, I want to remind everybody that Bet Online remains your uh, best and... Uh, best and latest way to stay up with all of the team matchup info, odds, player news, and game trends. You'll find all of that over at Bet Online. Always the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your favorite sports. Head on over to betonline.ag and receive your 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. And make sure to use that promo code BELIEVE. That's B L E A V to receive your rewards. Bet Online, where the game starts. The one and only Trevor Sikama joins Chargers Unleashed. We need a chime. Like the charges at least are now on the clock. Yeah. Could you get the chime in here, Dan? Like yes. eventually, especially over these next four weeks, I really want to hear the chime. The Chargers Unleashed podcast now selects Trevor Sikama from PFF and the NFL Stock Exchange. Coming up next on Chargers Unleashed. Live with us, the one and only PFF great, also NFL Stock Exchange co-host, the man, the myth, the legend himself, Mr. Trevor Sikama, joins us on Chargers Unleashed. Trevor Welcome back, obvious friend of the show. How have you been? How has your winter been? Oh, dude, it's uh, it's been great. Um, I thank you guys so much for having me back on the show. I told we were just chatting in the 
little pre-show lobby. It feels like a yearly tradition at this point, which is great. Um, I, I love getting to connect with you guys and talk some drafts. So I'm, I'm excited about this episode here. Absolutely. No, honestly, we're, we're grateful to have you. We got so much stuff to talk about, but I think that most people know Chargers fans are crazy about the NFL draft, crazy about their team getting better. Um, from your perspective, we've seen what the Chargers have done. They got Eric Kendricks. They re-signed some of their own. Some of their guys left uh, in free agency. From your perspective, high level, what do you see about this Chargers team? How do you see them positioned going in the NFL draft? If you're Tom Telesco, like, what are you focused on between now and and April 22nd. So I just recently wrote an article for PFF.com where I went over some updated team needs for teams following like the early parts of free agency. You mentioned like, it's not like free agency is over. They'll probably still make a handful of moves to just kind of sprinkle some guys throughout the roster. But I, it felt like, guys, obviously the Chargers didn't make any big splash outside of Kendricks, who I liked them getting in the building, but their needs then relatively stayed the same to where they were pre-free agency. So I look at, you know, interior defensive line. I look at ed the, the depth of edge rusher, especially. I think that we really saw last year how when Joey Bosa was out, they just didn't have another edge presence other than Khalil Mack. At least that's what it looked like from, from our vantage point. And so getting some depth there on the edge, getting a guy who's a little bit stronger, a little bit better of a two-gap player, a reliable guy to be able to uh, to uh, stop the run up front, to give you some flexibility to have some lighter boxes and some better athletes in the box. I think that those things along the defensive line is where I look at. And then offense too, right? Depending on what happens with Austin Eckler, like maybe they have a running back need of what, sorry, I didn't mean, I, I, sorry, we brought it up already. Ah, but I, but, so, just the cast with the whole the, Chargers fan base right depending now. Depending on what happens, um, obviously like they might have a running back need there if they think it's rich enough to go in the first round, I don't know if that they would. It feels like they would probably go a different direction. But um, speed at wide receiver, that's the topic that everybody's been talking about really for the Chargers over the last couple of years. And I still think they have that need as of right now. There's some guys that I think they could have the chance to take, and especially in the first round of this draft, they could really help them in the speed category. But um, when I look at the roster, just as an overview, that's kind of what I see. I want to transition from that because you were just talking about the edge rusher and the wide receiver position, Trevor. In your latest mock draft that you put out, you had the Chargers taking Will McDonald, edge rusher out of Iowa State at 21. Then in the next round, you had them taking Jalen Hyatt, who obviously fits the speed bill for what they need. And then the third round, you had them taking versatile offensive lineman uh, Tyler Steen out of, uh, from Alabama. Mm -hmm. I want to highlight the first two picks because I feel like if we did this exact same mock a month ago, <laughs> there's no way. <laughs> You maybe would have flipped Jalen Hyatt and Will McDonald given where their draft stock was at that That's point in time. Point. Yeah. And so I look at it now, and obviously Will McDonald, who's just a freak ath athlete, jumping over cars, tremendous week <laughs> at the Senior Bowl, uh, put on a great pro day. And then Jalen Hyatt, which it kind of seems like after the combine, just the wide receiver group in general, I don't want to say necessarily has taken away with how many are going to go in the first round, but overall as a group kind of just... I guess, died down as far as the hype goes for the overall group. But what went behind some of your logic behind Will McDonald and Jalen Hyatt going respectively in one, two? You know, that's it's a really good way to set up this question, saying that probably two months ago, I would say at least pre-senior bowl, we'd flip these guys. But I'm not going to lie. I, I was always very hesitant about Jalen Hyatt as a first-round wide receiver. Now, he had a ton of production this year. Belitnikov winner. I don't want to take anything away from him production-wise, but Hyatt didn't exactly contribute a heavy amount to Tennessee over the last two years before this season, in which they had, it felt like, the perfect offense, and they had so many of their different receivers, obviously what Hendon Hooker was able to do. They just had these guys in the perfect spot to be able to contribute at a massive level for a very high-flying offense that Josh Heupel runs there in Tennessee. It was like the perfect offense. So when you look at Jalen Hyatt, a lot of his production came with him off the line of scrimmage and stacked alignments in the slot, getting a full head of steam, and then just being able to really attack vertically against some corners that had no chance keeping up with his athleticism. That is still a dangerous weapon, and that is still something that I, I don't want to say is 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 totally useless or or shouldn't be valued. It definitely should. But 
Hyatt still has a long way to go to truly being a well-rounded wide receiver. The, now, some people believe that he can be, but the route tree right now, very, very limited for what he does. I mean, he is basically just a vertical player, a slant player, a screen player, a comeback player, and that's about it. He, he's not giving you a ton of nuance with how he's running his routes and how he's giving you double moves or setting up guys one way and cutting inside the other. Like He just doesn't do a ton of that. It, it's very straightforward with what he's doing, but his speed was so good he was such an incredible asset at the college level. He didn't really need to do anything else, especially in that Tennessee offense that allowed him to thrive there. So I was always a little bit hesitant with him being a first round pick. But, you know, that was one of the selections where as I went down through the second round, I found myself taking these other players for other teams in front of the Chargers that I thought were really good picks, were really logical picks for them to attack some areas of need on the roster. And then all of a sudden, I get to the Chargers in the second round, and Hyatt's sitting there. I'm like, all right, well, this worked out perfect. Because before, it was like, okay, I, I ended up giving them Will McDonald because I do feel like Will McDonald is somewhere of a late first-round range. It feels like where the NFL is really predicting that he's going to go. And so... They get him in there. It's a nice speed rusher to complement with some of the bigger guys that he has over there and or that, that he would play with in Khalil Mack and, and Joey Bosa. So I like that pick there, but I believe I picked him over a handful of the wide receivers. I can't remember if Quentin Johnson was still on the board, but I think Zay Flowers was still on the board as well. And I was like, no, I, you got to go. I think you got to go trenches. I think you got to go edge rusher. You got to dip into the edge rush class in the first round. And then it just happened to work out where Hyatt was available in the second. And honestly, that's a game plan that I think the Chargers should stick with going into draft day of, of emphasizing more of the defensive side of the football for the first round and then seeing what wide receivers, perhaps even Jalen Hyatt, is going to be available for you uh, in the second and third rounds. Now, I got to ask, one of the things that Chargers fans have been clamoring for, you mentioned it earlier, was kind of the speed. And I honestly think it's like speed slash athleticism. I would put kind of speed and quickness, two different things. But I think the Chargers need both. This show, we've gone crazy with like the looking at the, whether it's the Jalen Hyatt, whether it's the Zay Flowers, whether it's the Tank Dells, whether it's the Trey Palmer, you got Trey Tucker. There's so many guys that kind of fit those bills. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily who the best one of those guys is, which you can answer that if you'd like. But in terms of who you think is the best fit or best fits for the Chargers at receiver with what their needs are. Yeah. If you're Tom Telesco and you're going for day one, day two, and day three, who's one guy on each day best fit in your opinion? Okay, so if it's day one... I do think it comes down to Quentin Johnson or Zay Flowers. Um, I think both of those guys have really nice athleticism, and it, it, it's just juice, right? I think that's the word that, that I continually use for the Chargers receiver when it comes to them adding a new guy. Is they just need more juice in there because when people talk about speed, they go like, oh, okay, let's go after the Deshaun Jackson type. And if there's not a Deshaun Jackson type, then it doesn't help them. I don't agree with that. I just think good speed and athleticism – in the offense overall would really help. So I think probably Quentin Johnson and Zay Flowers because of what they're able to give you after the catch. I, I think I'd mainly lean Zay for the Chargers specifically. Um, I just like Zay Flowers a lot and how he could play all three um, receiver spots and he could play it very, very well. Second round, I would say that Jalen Hyatt, I have to stick with Jalen Hyatt. I think that Jalen Hyatt is got to be their target in round two. And then rounds three and four, I'd just say the mid rounds, depending on when these guys are going to go. Tyler Scott from Cincinnati, another guy who can absolutely fly. Um, Jaden Reed, I would say, from Michigan State, another guy who had a really nice senior bowl, really impressed me with what he was able to do. I think that Jaden Reed is somebody who should definitely be on their radar. And then when I'm looking at this list, if you go a little bit further, maybe, yeah, I guess that mid-round mid round rage. Andre Yosef is from Princeton, maybe a little bit later, maybe just early day three guy. Um, he is somebody who at the combine he showed he's got a ton of athleticism. So he's bringing a lot of athleticism to the table. So those would kind of be the tiers and targets of wide receivers that I would have for the chargers. I want to transition there. Cause you brought up Andre Yosevis into your sleeper article that you put out this week with your prospects that you felt are beginning to slept on right now. And three of those prospects, the chargers have actually met with and tight end uh, Tucker craft, uh, McLennan Curtis, and then BJ Thompson mm. highlight some of those. Cause even the Tucker craft one, I feel like after the combine and for you to still say that, you know, people are sleeping on him after a productive day like that, go into a little and, and highlight a, a, you know, just what you see from each one of these players. Yeah. So I would say, 
Yosevich is is just like it's the overall athleticism, man. I, I think that he got to Mobile and he got to the Senior Bowl, and you could definitely see it, it wasn't too much for him when when he was going up because the Senior Bowl is very useful for a lot of different ways. Something that I like the most about it is you're taking players and you're taking them out of their system that they've been in for a long, long time. You're placing them in a new environment with new coaches, new coaching staff, new players around them, and you're basically saying how quickly can you both adapt and stand out. And I felt like Yosevis, where there was there was a lot of great wide receivers that were that were playing that week. I think Michael Wilson was one of my favorites from Stanford, who was able to stand out. I mentioned Jaden Reed from Michigan State; he stood out as well. Tank Dell certainly was able to do that too. But Yosevis was another guy who was like, okay, this guy can hang. Like this guy is is definitely up to that standard. And so I think he's a really nice option. Tucker Craft, coming from San Diego State, or not San Diego State, sorry, South Dakota State. <laughs> A lot of people are going to say like, oh, the next Dallas Goddard. He's the next Dallas Goddard. He's right in line. It's a similar school. It's a similar style. And where he is that receiving kind of tight end, he's not as well-rounded as Dallas Goddard was. I I like Dallas Goddard a lot more when Dallas Goddard was coming out. But even though that means Kraft might be picked, you know, a round or two lower than what Goddard was selected in the second round, I still think he's a good receiving prospect. Like, I still think he's a really good big-bodied wide receiver, a natural athlete in that regard. He's a little bit stiff, but it's fine. I mean, like, he's a bigger-bodied wide receiver, and that's just physics. It's just, it, it, it's it's how it goes. When you get the bigger body, it's tougher to turn on a corner. And so I, I don't think it's anything that's really glaring where you go, man, this guy's like a, you know, he's like a submarine. The guy's like a boat. He can't turn. I don't think it's anything <laughs> like that. So I think that he's a nice receiving option, and I think he's one that, especially because it's a really good tight end class, if you like Tucker Craft, and you could probably get him round three. I don't know if he's going to last till round four, but you know Michael Mayer, Darnell Washington, Luke Musgraves, Dalton Kincaid, like Sam Laporta, all of those guys might go above where Tucker Craft goes, but that doesn't make Craft any worse of a player. It just means that the tight end class was really good in front of him. So you got a chance to pick him a little bit later, maybe get some some uh, later day two value there with him, and then McClendon, man. He is somebody who has played both on the interior and at at at, uh, at tackle for Chattanooga. And from the couple of games that I watched of him, when you watch guys at the FCS level, especially in the trenches, one, you want them to look different, right? When they get out on the field, you want to be able to go like there are some times when I'll go to say like, all right, I'm going to I'm going to watch McClendon and uh, like I'll click on his film and the film will come up and I'll go, ah, crap, I forgot to see like what number he is. With guys at the FCS level, you want to be able to like, oh, the tape comes on and I don't even need to like check what his number is. I go, that's got to be him because we're talking about him at an NFL level. And that is actually what happened with him. He was simply bigger, more well-built. And the second the ball was snapped, he's firing off the ball. His strength level is very noticeable. And so when you get these guys at lower level competition, you have to see them dominate. And I felt like I did see him dominate in that regard. Uh, I saw I was I watched one full game of him when he was playing in, at an interior offensive line position. I thought he did really great as a people mover. You know, he's clearing all sorts of holes in between the A and B gaps. And then when I watched him in offensive tackle as well, I think the power was still his main game, but he was still able to stay in front of guys pretty well. So I wonder if he's going to be more of an interior guy at the NFL level, but he does have at least that experienced versatility to where if you're in a pinch, you could probably play him at either spot. So that's kind of the way that I view him. The Chargers are kind of in an interesting position uh, where they have, I think they going into the off season, they needed to fix the right tackle situation in terms of making sure they get Trey Pipkins back or get a free agent. They were able to get him back. Mm -hmm. They brought Eric Kendricks in replacing Drew Tranquil. Those were kind of the two biggest positions. I think the Chargers needed to make sure were figured out to where they can, in theory, go BPA. They brought in Donald Parham Jr. on a re-sign. So he now is kind of that tight end two position alongside of Gerald Everett. But I think there's still some folks wanting tight end and tight end early. In your opinion, the Chargers kind of have three main positions I think a lot of people are talking about. Tight end, edge, wide receiver. Mm -hmm. How would you go about that? Which round would you do each of those? That's a good question. Um, I think if they still want tight end, then they're probably looking for a major upgrade because what's 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 Everett's status, right? Like, how, how long is he going to be there? I'm, and I'm genuinely asking you guys, like, what, how long do you think that he's going to be there? Do you think there's going to be a long-term 
thing for him, or do you think it was franchise tag and, and we're out of here? So Gerald Everett, he signed a two-year deal last year. Right. So this is the second deal. Right. It's roughly $6 million per year. So if he balls out, I can see him getting re-signed. No way he gets franchise tagged. Right. So he okay. either gets re-signed okay. or move on. Oh, no, wait. I'm thinking in my head. Sorry, I'm getting my tight ends mixed up. I was thinking about Evan Ingram, who got the franchise <laughs> tag. And that was what was in my head. So I thought that. Okay, so, but I know that people have looked at the every situation and thought about that, like whether it was a long-term thing, whether he was sticking around, what was going to happen with him. But if you really want to make a splash at tight end, then in my head, you're, you're probably going to have to go in round one because – any guys that you're going to get after that, sure, they might be fine for your team, but like if you lose him as a pass catching option or if a focal point in the offense, I don't know if any of the guys that you're going to draft in the second or third round at tight end are going to be like, oh, okay, we lost him. We're good now. You're probably still going to want to draft another guy anyway. So if you're going to have that problem, why not address it with a player that you're going to be okay with? If you have a Michael Mayer, if you have a Dalton Kincaid, if you have a Darnell Washington, you could probably pull the trigger on them in round one, and I think you're making a difference there. The other ones were edge and wide receiver, right? Is yep. that what you said? Yep. See this now. Now it's now it's tricky, and and this is why I ultimately was saying they should wait on wide receiver until rounds two or three because it's hard for me to sit here and say, oh yeah, you can wait on edge. Edge is a premium position in the NFL. The good ones go early. That's just how it goes. Not that you can't get a good one in rounds two and three. Like sometimes that certainly happens, but your odds decrease a lot the further you get back from number one overall. So I think that the way that I would formulate it is you go tight end or edge, whichever one you really want to prioritize more in that first round. You're probably sticking with wide receiver no matter what in the second round because you're probably going to want to get the player that you want there. And then third round, you know, I think you could throw corner in there maybe as well, but it, it might just be whoever you didn't, whichever position you didn't pick in round one. So if you're going for a tight end and one is still available, if there's a corner that falls and you like them, if there's an edge rusher that you like as a depth piece in round three, that's probably how I would formulate the plan, knowing that there's a lot of picks between number one and where they select for the first time in the first round. Trevor, I wanted to talk about one of the biggest risers since the combine, and obviously that's Nolan Smith, who has garnered a lot of interest from Chargers fans and obviously just blew everybody away with his combine. And I've seen his draft stock be in saying, oh, he's for sure a top 10 pick or he's going in the teens or he's going in the early 20s. And just the conversations that I've listened to you and and Connor talk about with him, because I know, especially in your dissecting of Daniel Jeremiah's mock draft, having him go to, what was it, 13 to the Jets Mm -hmm. in his latest one. And then I've seen ones where it's even gotten to the Chargers where you've been the one selecting for the Chargers and there was Nolan Smith and there was Miles Murphy on the board and you Mm -hmm. went Miles Murphy in that scenario. What is it about Nolan Smith? Is it just the, you know, the undersize as far as the weight goes? Is it coming off of the injury? But what is it that has maybe either held some people back as far as their opinions of him or what's really just attributed to his overall rise as far as um, this edge class goes? Yeah, so first of all, from everything I learned, I I don't think he's making it at 21. Like, I think he's going to be off the board before he gets to 21. He's too damn athletic. Um, he's, he has a magnetic personality. He absolutely loves the game of football. He's always trying to get better. He's a dirty work player. He takes run defense as seriously as you will see any pass rush player that has his caliber of athleticism and coaches are just going to absolutely love this kid. So it's, it's hard. It it is hard for me to believe that a player like that is going to get past the top 20. So I have a very hard time that Nolan Smith is going to be available at 21, but if he is, he'd be a fantastic player to choose from. Now, the reason why he's not like this guaranteed 100% going to be a top 10 overall selection is because, you know, the statistics weren't there for him. He just was not somebody who, and he's he still right now, I, I did a feature piece on him. So I got to sit down and talk with him one-on-one a little bit. And, you know, I, I, I'd asked him about his mentality towards defending the run. And, you know, he got a big smile talking about it. And he's like, you know, look at Georgia. He's like, no matter who you are, if you play your hand in the dirt on the defensive line, like you're two gapping, like that, that is your responsibility. You are there to defend the run and hold the line of scrimmage. And you are supposed to leave the linebackers as clean as possible to come in and make the tackle at the line of scrimmage or shoot a gap and get into the backfield. That is your job. 100%. Now, when you get into advantageous pass rush situations, sure. You can pin your ears back a little bit, but you know, I, I, I asked Nolan, what's something you're looking forward to about playing at the NFL level. And he's like, 
man, I watch these rushers and they'll align in, you know, like a seven point uh alignment or a wide nine and he's like we didn't get to do that at georgia he's like yeah they, he's like kirby smart wouldn't even let you that far off the line of scrimmage and he was just excited about being able to set offensive linemen up and learn when to attack the outside shoulder when to hit the inside moves all that because it sure sounded like he did not get much of that opportunity at georgia and so i think that's the big allurement to him as you look at the athleticism that we saw at the combine and you go my goodness this guy's off the charts but he doesn't have the production so it's going to be a slow Slow burn for him to really put that athleticism into his craft and into a pass rush profile because he just does not have that right now with that experience. A lot of it is the same kind of talk that we had about Trayvon Walker last year, right? Crazy athlete, no pass rush plan at all whatsoever. Just doesn't have the experience. And I think that that's kind of where we are with Nolan Smith. Now, we're definitely going to get your predictions. We're going to put you on the hot seat here a little bit for when we discuss the possibilities of, you know, possibly what the Chargers could do at 21. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, But what I do want to ask you about is we saw a lot of people talk about uh, the, the linebacker situation that's gone on here and drew tranquil, no longer a member of the chargers Mm -hmm. Um, for you. I doubt the Chargers do this on day one, maybe day two, but it's probably day three. What are some of the linebacker options that you think could fit in Brandon Staley's scheme? He doesn't really value. I don't want to say he doesn't value. It doesn't seem like he prioritizes that position as much as other positions. Right. But who are some of those guys? Yeah, well, I mean, if you're going off of what the Chargers have done in the past, I think athletes are certainly going to stand out to them, right? They're not going to pick a non-athlete in the middle. If we're talking like pure inside linebacker types, I think Jack Campbell is perfect for them, the Iowa linebacker. I don't know if they have the opportunity to take him. Like, I don't know if he's even going to still be there at, when did they pick? Fifth, when it, what is it? 50, 54. 54 in the second round. I don't know if Jack Campbell makes it 54 because Jack Campbell is one of the, you know, this linebacker class is, we talked about this on our podcast. It is a microcosm of where it feels like the NFL is going with a lot of these hybrid players because like, Trent, I'll, I, I can I can list a couple of them off here. Diane Henley used to be a safety. Now he turned into a linebacker. Shoot, he used to be a wide receiver, and now he's a linebacker. <laughs> Drew Sanders, he was an edge rusher. They converted him to a linebacker. Trenton Simpson, he's a safety. Now he's a linebacker. Demarion Overshone was a safety. Now he's a linebacker, right? And it's just like there are so many of these small safety athlete hybrid players within this position that all of a sudden – you you appreciate them because they're different and they fit on their current schemes in college. But when you approach it for an NFL draft perspective and you go, okay, this team needs a linebacker, you go, damn, we don't really have a lot of pure off-ball linebackers even in this class. I mean, pure off-ball linebackers, we're talking about Jack Campbell, Dorian Williams from Tulane, Ivan Pace, but I mean, Ivan Pace is basically just like a blitzing middle linebacker. Noah Sewell's not athletic enough to play the position. Owen Papo, Henry Toho Toho. But like, that's about it. The rest of the guys in this class are either linebacker edge hybrids or they're linebacker safety hybrids. So certainly they would love to get Jack Campbell, but I don't know if he's going to be there for you at 54. Around the area in which they would pick an off-ball linebacker, I feel like Dorian Williams from Tulane maybe Diane Henley, but I think that he might be gone a little bit early as well because of how athletic he is. And I would say Owen Papo as well, just because those are the, those guys check the athletic box that it feels like the chargers consistently gravitate towards while being still of that traditional off ball linebacker mentality. One more player spotlight that I'd like to ask you about Trevor, before we ask you your predictions here. Um, I firmly believe that, and obviously this depends on the Chargers' pursuit of safety, John Johnson, but I still believe that they were going into this season, especially with this situation with Nasir Adderley, that they were going to pursue safety. Obviously, Brandon Staley loves his secondary players in the draft. And one player that is uh, a favorite of mine to watch, and I know that you have championed for him, is Illinois safety, Sidney Brown. Mm -hmm. And I just think his versatile skill set is just fantastic for whatever you want to play this guy. And so... I've heard you talk about him on the pod. I just wanted to pick your brain a little bit more about him and what he brings to the game. Dude, he's he's awesome. I mean, he just has such a phenomenal 
mind for the position, mind for the game. I mean, they use him as a free safety. They use him as a strong safety. They use him as a linebacker at times. I mean, they'll use him as a blitzer. He'll cover tight ends and man coverage. They also really like to allow him to roam and basically just be this defender who could lean on his instincts to know where the ball was going and make an impact on the ball. That's how much they trusted this guy on the back end. So I think Sidney Brown has the opportunity to play any spot in the safety in, in that back end. So if you wanted him to play more of a free safety, I think he definitely could. I think he's got that, that athleticism to him. He's got a little bit of an injury history to him, but dude, he's so great. And there's a lot of really nice safeties in this class. Um, some guys that I like outside of Sidney Brown that they could probably get on day, day two and beyond. Jamie Robinson from Florida State. We asked him at the combine, you know, about versatility because that's it's it's just a it's just like a buzzword. It feels like you know, like every every time we get to the the safeties, everybody will be like, oh, talk about your versatility, and it's like normally they just give like kind of a vanilla answer about it. But Jamie um, Robinson from Florida State, when they asked him about his versatility, he's like, well, okay, that's something that I take very very seriously, and it, and he's like, it also is something that takes a lot of work. A lot of guys when they're asked about their versatility they just say oh you know i think that i'm i'm strong enough to play strong safety and i think i'm fast enough to play slot and that's like the whole answer robinson was like in order for me to be able to play a lot of different spots on florida state's defense i knew that i had to mentally understand each position so he's like i would go into the safety room on wednesdays and we go over the safety game plan then i'd go into the cornerback room the next day and i'd wow. understand what the corners are doing and then the third day he's like we talk about like third down situations and like what the linebackers were doing and he said that he was in a different room every day for i think three straight days before leading up to the final days of practice and then you get Smart. to the game on saturday so he understood that it's not just oh i'm a good athlete that means that i'm versatile he takes pride in it saying that no you have to actually like learn what your responsibilities are at all of these spots in order to actually be called upon to play them so he's somebody that i really liked in that regard um and i'll say that maybe a, a day three safety that i think is not getting enough love is chris smith from georgia um Take the combine 40 yard dash and just like throw it in the trash. It doesn't matter. I don't care. The, the, he plays so much faster than what his 40 time was. Actually, let me I, I, I let me see what his percentile was. On the fly. I like this. We got Trevor thinking about on the fly going rapid speed on the type. Let's go. Come on, Here we go. Chris Smith, where is it? Come on. <laughs> let, let's see. Uh, no, no, no airtime can go. Uh, unused with Trevor Sikama. He will do all he can to make sure he gets all the data so our listeners can, can find, find it. it. I can't find it. Why, you can why? do it. You can do it. I've, I've been dragging this on long enough. Jake, anything else? Any jokes you have while we do this? <laughs> I'm going to find this. All right, you I'm, do I'm terrible at jokes, so that doesn't work. I found it. Okay. He ran, he ran a 4.62 40-yard dash, which is in the 26th percentile. Again, throw it out. I don't care. He's not a 462 player. You watch the Oregon game alone, and this man is flying. He was playing in the 4440 speeds at, at during that game. And so I've seen it on tape. Whatever we saw at the combine, I throw it out. He's a great day three safety. That's basically what I was trying to say before I derailed y'all's show for you. <laughs> Have, have you and Connor had arguments about that? Because I know Connor's whole thing is like, hey, if you're a DB and you're running in the four sixes, you're not going to have you know that tremendous of an NFL career. Yeah, Cameron Chancellor. I, I don't think. I don't think we've, you know, thrown hands about it on the podcast, <laughs> but I do, th I do think that when we went over the combine episode, uh, I did bring up the fact that Chris Smith ran slow. And I think he agreed that it's like, he's not that slow. He did because sometimes guys run slow at the combine and then you go back to the tape and you go, all right. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're not accelerating the way that you need to. We're not seeing that final gear. I just didn't really notice it until you ran a slow 40 time. I, I was I was floored by how slow Chris Smith was, and I, I don't think that he's that slow. So, Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you this bluntly before we get into your predictions. Trevor Sikama, charges yeah. are at 21. Bijan Robinson's on the board. Oh, man. Jeez. Are Do you I drafting take him? him? Do I, am, am I taking him, or are they taking him? Which are one? you taking him? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I... My my first instinct is to do the typical draft Nick cop out and saying, well, who else is on the board? <laughs> I don't know if so. Like if if Austin Eckler's gone, I think they think about it. And you know what? I'd think about it at twenty one. Bijan's that good. Bijan's insane. Bijan's one of the best running back prospects I've ever scouted. It's the cleanest scouting report I have. 
what's bad about this dude? I don't know. If he stays healthy, he's just he's going to be phenomenal for so many years. He is one of the few guys that is of that Christian McCaffrey type mold. And I mean, like, so is Austin Eckler, right? Austin Eckler gives so much to this team in the run game and the receiving game. That's exactly what Bijan Robinson does as well, except for, you know, Eckler's looking for more money on a on a veteran contract, and Bijan would be sitting there with five years of a rookie contract. So I think that he would be absolutely on the board. I prob- I, I'm going to be honest. I think there's an edge rusher that I would like that would still be on the board that would sway me away from that. But I'd think about it. I would. It has been hot takes all over the place of if you should or should not get Bijan Robinson if he's there at 21. All right. We're going to put get, you on the hot seat. I, I get fired from PFF if I said yes. So um, <laughs> I'm, uh, <laughs> I, I have to hedge. I have to, I have to say no. I think contractually. Smart man aligned to his paycheck. All right. So we're putting in the hot seat here, Trevor. Uh-huh. We've done this with everyone who seems to know a thing or two about the, the draft mm-hmm. and about this Chargers team. Day one, day two, day three. One prediction. Who do you see the Chargers picking at 21? All things considered... Day one, then they say round two and round three. Okay. This is a lot of pressure. I'm gonna say while Zeke. you're thinking about this, I do want to preference yes. that Trevor Sigma two years ago hit the home run pick when he selected Rashawn Slater for, for the on trial. our show. By the way, Once, nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> you're welcome. The only reason Rashawn Slater is a Los Angeles Charger. This guy is is because they listen to the show. Obviously, (laughs) obviously, they're big fans of the show. We keep trying to tell them. No one listens to us, but maybe they'll listen to you. Look, the front office clearly listens. Okay, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say Zay Flowers. I'm gonna say Zay Flowers is the first round pick. Chargers go into a frenzy. Chargers fan base is going bananas if Zay Flowers gets picked in a good way or a bad way. Honestly, I think regardless of what they do, 50% of the fan base is going to be ecstatic. 50% two of the months ago, fan base is going to be ecstatic. Two months ago, they probably would have all, you know, 90% of them went bonkers. Now it's more like 50 50. <laughs> oh, 54 is tough. I'm between two players. If Tuli Tui Polotu from USC is still there at 54. I think he'd be great. I think they'd love him. But I don't know if he makes it to 54. Do any of the top three tight ends make it to 54? No. 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 For tight end, you're you're basically at 54. I think you're basically looking at... You're looking at Tucker Craft or maybe Sam Laporta. Mm. All right. I'll say Sidney Brown at 54. And then, what pick do they have in the third round? What number is it? Oh, I can't uh, do that. Hang on. This is buying me time. See, this is this, is a, veteran, this is a veteran move. <laughs> it's 85. 85. It's 85. Folks Man. don't appreciate how much effort that Trevor Sikama puts into these picks. No, it's, I care about I mean, this because like, this, this is fun. Yeah. This is the fun part for me. Like the team building is fun. So, all right, let's go. Zay, Sidney Brown, Derek Hall from Auburn. The edge oh, yes, please. The edge rusher. That's yes, what I, please. That's, that's what I'm going with. You I'm heard it to, here first. I'm trying to manifest. I'm trying to manifest it. <laughs> you heard it here first. You're going to see the Chargers pick Zay Flowers at 21, followed by Sidney Brown, Derek Hall. Uh, Trevor. We can't get you out of here without talking about NFL Stock Exchange. Mm. We all know about all the sex addicts everywhere. There's Jeez. a lot of them. <laughs> and look, at the end of the day, they go to you. They go to you for guidance. They go to you for assistance with their lives. Um, talk about NFL Stock Exchange. Honestly, it's one of my favorite shows I listen to every episode. Talk to us about kind of how it came to fruition, what you guys are doing there now, and what folks can expect. Oh, man, uh, we're having a blast. Um, getting to do this podcast and this show with Connor Rogers has been so much fun over the last year. Uh, we started it in January of last year. Um, we started doing it on the PFF YouTube channel and obviously on, on all your audio-only formats as well. But uh, this past February, we ended up branching off, and we're still part of PFF, but a lot of the shows got their own channel, and so the Stock Exchange got their own YouTube channel. It's youtube.com backslash at NFL Stock Exchange, and... 
Man, it's been so much fun. It's been so much fun building that community there. And whenever we do mock draft episodes or player ranking episodes or have another guest on, the comment section in on the YouTube videos is my favorite part. It's so many just different draft fans and draft nuts going like, oh, like the, like we, we, we here's what we think about this player. This is what we'd want to see in this situation. And it's been a blast. We're coming to you guys every you know, two or three times a week. And we're keeping... We're keeping people as informed as much as we can, whether it's what we think about these prospects, where we think they're going to go, where we think they should go, our personal evaluation on the classes, as well as what we're hearing, the mock drafts and 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 the uh, the things that we do there. I think they reflect that, and we're trying to make sure that we keep tabs on all of these teams and give you really great projections as well. So not only do you guys, if you listen to the NFL Stock Exchange podcast, not only will you know about these prospects yourself, but hopefully you'll know about where they might be going as well, which is what makes this a lot of fun. Man, at Tampa Bay Trey is where you can find him on Twitter. Uh, probably, I don't know, are you still sulking about the Tom Brady thing now that you have Baker Mayfield? How are you feeling about that? No, he's coming back. <laughs> <laughs> or, or possibly Will Levis. According to DJ. Oh, no, no, no way. No, <laughs> no, no, I don't think that's happening either. No, I think it's the great, I think it's the great American Baker show in, uh, in, in Tampa Bay. That's what I, that's what I think they're up to. So Trevor, best of luck to you and your Tampa Bay Buccaneers and to Connor. I know recent engagement props to Connor, both of you guys now engaged shout yeah, out. It's true. Um, it's true. thank you so much for coming on, man. Always a pleasure. Uh, excited to have you on next year. Calling shots again. Uh, Trevor Sykema, NFL Stock Exchange, PFF. You're the best, man. We'll talk to you soon, all right? Thanks, guys. Appreciate it, as always. Liberty's leave policy was tremendous. Having the ability to take 16 weeks off, fully paid to bond with my child was an incredible experience. At Liberty Mutual, you can find a career that supports you at every step, even baby steps. We offer up to 16 weeks parental leave for new moms and dads. And because not everyone's pathway to parenthood looks the same, we offer robust fertility, surrogacy, and adoption benefits too. Learn more at libertymutualcareers.com and pursue your tomorrow today.